new mystery virus from China. The variation of the coronavirus. Wall Street's worst day in more than a decade. Father and son accused of chasing and gunning down an unarmed black man. The two largest blazes in Colorado's history. Oh my God. Forcing the evacuations of thousands. That storm system that's causing so many problems in Texas. No end in sight. More than 500 fires burning out of control across California. So that thing keeps Good morning, church. Uh, we're continuing in our series called What's Going On? And I want to start off this morning talking to you about uh, an experience that many of us have had. It's something called porch pirates. Now, maybe you're like, Randy, what, what do you mean porch pirates? I, I mean, not these kind of porch pirates, not, not like the trickery treaty porch pirates. I mean, like these kind of porch pirates. Uh, there was four and a half billion dollars that was stolen off of people's porches last year in the United States. Now, now this is a this is a new phenomenon. It it just could not happen through the vast majority of human history. What we have shown in this series is that we are living in an unprecedented time. One of the manifestations is this thing we call uh, porch pirates that steal about four and a half billion dollars worth of uh, merchandise a year. Now, I want, to, I want to picture something. So now you've, you've looked online and you have found some item that you want and you have given your credit card information. So you've purchased it and now you're waiting on it. So you've done all the right things. You're waiting on it. You're entitled to it. You have paid for this item. So you are entitled to it. But then you go the day that you're expecting it, and maybe you see, like in this picture, you see one of these porch pirates grabbing your item and, and running as fast as he or she can down the street. Now, here's the question. How do you feel? This item that you owned, you were entitled to, you paid for it. You're entitled to this item. You waited for it. Someone else takes. You have been ripped off. You have been cheated. You have been deprived of what you were entitled to. How do you feel? Now, I'm just going to take a risk here and suggest that most of us are not going to be singing zippity doo dah zippity day. We're going to be feeling a little bit negative, maybe more. Maybe we're going to be a little ticked off, maybe a little angry, a little hostile, because something that we were entitled to we have been deprived of. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, going somewhere important. So, so keep that in mind. When I believe that I'm entitled to something and I am being deprived of it, it changes me mentally and emotionally, and I'm not in a zippity doo dah sort of a mood. I'm in a hostile, negative mood. How does God feel about this? Pause for a minute. What do you think? You might be surprised to find that God feels with you if you're not singing zippity doo dah. Let me read you. This is, this is the tenth of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. And I'm reading from the, the NIV translation. Let me just read it to you. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant. His ox or donkey, his ox, think, you know, his John Deere tractor, his donkey, think, your ride, your car, or anything. Notice this, or any, don't covet anything that, and this next word is big, that belongs, belongs, he owns it, he's entitled to it, that belongs to your neighbor. So, this is confusing. You know, if you look at the commandments before, you've got things like, you know, hey, don't murder, don't lie, don't steal. You know, these are big, big and clear, and we understand them. But all of a sudden, covet? What is covet? We're not even sure what covet means today. Well, covet means I want it. I desire it. So with that in mind, let me read it to you again. The Tenth Commandment. God says, You shall not covet, think, want, or desire your neighbor's house, you shall not covet or desire or want your neighbor's wife or husband, I could just throw in there, or his manservant or maidservant. These are people that work for you know the company, the conglomerate, the farm, whatever. His ox, that's kind of his, his plowing mechanism, his John Deere tractor, his donkey, that's his ride, or anything. Now, now get this, you shall not, I shall not, we shall not covet, want, desire anything 
that belongs to our neighbor. Now, this is God's way of saying, first of all, private property, God says, is legitimate. It's part of His eternal plan. That's one statement we can look at. It belongs, He says, to that other person. Second observation, I'm looking at the neighbor and I don't have what he has. He has some things that I don't have or else I wouldn't be coveting or wanting or desiring them. This states then that God has chosen in this short period of time called human history that He is deliberately putting us at different economic levels. Some of you are so angry just hearing that right now. you you got this egalitarian thing going where everybody ought to be living at the same level and you know there's a lot of social ideology behind that but i'm telling you god from the beginning intended for human beings to live during this little short juncture in life he's got a different mission for each of us a different set of context and uh, entrustments he intends for us to live at different levels that's why he said don't be looking over there at your neighbor and looking at his ox just because you don't have an ox don't be desiring his god does not see anything wrong with me not having something that you do have and it's yours and you're entitled to it as long as of course you've gotten it honestly okay okay so that that was kind of an aside but but here's the important thing when i feel entitled to something when i feel something belongs to me and i don't have it i'm being deprived of it i feel like i'm being cheated I am not a happy camper. And this feeds into this last day society that the Scripture speaks about in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. Let me read you that passage once again. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul is about to be beheaded by Nero. It's his last writing. He knows that it's coming. And he's writing to Timothy, who has been his partner in ministry for over 22 years. He says, But understand this, in the last days... There will come times of difficulty. Other translations, perilous times. Times of difficulty. We said Scripture uses last days in two ways. One version of last days is when the full revelation of God was complete in Christ, particularly His crucifixion and resurrection. Now we know everything that we can comprehend about God. And when the New Testament was completed, that's called the last days. For example, in Hebrews 1, chapter 2, it says, In these last days... God has spoken to us through His Son. Okay, so that's the last days. They were finished when the book of Revelation was complete in AD 96. But then Scripture speaks about Old Testament and New Testament again and again, redundantly, about the last days being a compressed period of time, approximately seven years before the return of Christ to intervene in human history. That's the last days that the Apostle Paul is writing about here. And he's saying there's going to be a tremendous shakeup in society, a tremendous change, a massive change in the mindset, the attitudes, the behavior patterns of people in society in this period of time. But understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Why, Paul? For people will be lovers of self. We dealt with that in the first first, first message. Lovers of money. Proud and arrogant. We dealt with that. People are trying to prove their worth. Uh, Blasphemous or abusive. Disobedient to their parents. We dealt with that. That people uh, have no respect for God or man anymore. Unholy, heartless. uh, Excuse me, I skipped one. Disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful. Now that's important because that's the one we're going to zero in on today. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, Unappeasable, that one too. So we're going to zero in on ungrateful and unappeasable. Ungrateful is obvious. Unappeasable is a little less obvious. It is the idea that you're never going to satisfy me no matter what you say, no matter what kind of reconciliation you offer, no matter what you give me, no matter what you suggest, I'm not going to be satisfied. I'm entitled to more, and I'm not going to be satisfied until I have all that I'm entitled to. That is what is behind this unappeasable attitude. It goes on to say people will be slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. So there's our text once again. Now, as I said, today we're going to deal with verse 2, ungrateful, and verse 3, unappeasable, which I've already kind of defined that. So I'm suggesting to you today that 
we are absolutely living in the fulfillment of this prophetic scripture. Each week, I've given you reasons why. Of the 108 billion people who have ever lived and died on planet Earth, we are in this tiny percentage of about 3% that have experienced the things that we consider to be normal. For example, electricity. 97% of the people who ever lived and died on planet Earth didn't have electricity. The population itself didn't reach 1 billion until about 1850. Now we're nearly 8 billion. So we have a population explosion, we have a knowledge explosion, we have a technology explosion. We have all these things simultaneous, but the most important thing that is happening in our day that has never happened before in human history is we are being discipled around the clock. We are being propagandized, we are being taught, we are being molded, we are being shaped. But it's not discipled by Jesus, it's being discipled by a thought system that disregards God, disregards principle, disregards what is right, puts man and man's desires at the center, and it's creating now. It's reached the tipping point where the numbers of people that have embraced, because we're, we're propagandized through the media, the mass media communication system teaches us, bombards us, propagandizes us around the clock in massive numbers like never before in human history. So now you have masses, billions of people that suddenly have swung in their attitude and the tipping point has been reached that we are now in these perilous times. I've said it each week, I'll say it again because I don't want the word going out. Randy's predicting the end of the world. Randy, are you saying we are in the last seven years of human history? No, I am not saying that. But I'm not not saying that either. Each week I've said, I don't believe that. I think we still have some time, but we are absolutely living toward the very intervention of Christ. And this is exciting, the very intervention of Christ in human history. Okay, so today, what we want to look at is this thing of entitlement. We live in a society today that masses, millions of people, billions of people feel entitled entitled to things that humans have never felt entitled to before. And when I feel entitled to something and I'm deprived of it, I feel angry. I've been cheated. It's mine. It, I, you owe me. I'm entitled to it. And when I don't get it, now I'm hostile. That is one of the reasons why our society is so hostile today, where people are so demanding and so impossible to satisfy, you know, today. So, what I want to do with you first is let's recognize the dynamics of what I'm calling human entitlement. There, there, there's some components. What are the dynamics of human entitlement? I mean, what are the pieces that create this frame of mind, this attitude? Well, well the first one is something I'm calling, it's, it's seductive. It's seductive, this thing that I'm entitled, I have it coming, I am owed. It goes like this. It, it has a core conviction. If I desire it, I should be able to acquire it. Whatever I desire, I should be able to acquire. I'm entitled. If I desire it, I'm entitled to it. And if I don't have it, I'm being cheated. I'm being ripped off. I'm being deprived. Now, now this is enormous in creating restlessness and discontent and hostility and anger in people and in masses now. That's why that, that tipping point has been reached are feeling this way. We, we see it seething in the streets all the time now. Everywhere you go, you meet it. Listen to what it says in 1 John. So this, this human entitlement system is, first of all, seductive. It lures us, it entices us, because it sounds so good. Whatever I desire, I should be able to acquire. If I desire it, I should be able to have it, in other words. 1 John chapter 2, though, it warns. It says, do not love this world or the things it offers you. When you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. In other words, the love of the Father won't, won't create the kind of value system that the world stirs. And it's going to tell you what the value system is. For the world offers only, get this now, only a craving for physical pleasure. In other words, I, I, the, the world does things to stimulate us, to stir us, to arouse us, to cause us to covet more and more and more physical pleasure. For the world only offers a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see. Bigger, better, newer, nicer. Bigger, better, newer, nicer. On and on it goes. Everything we see, we want. It says, so the world stirs this craving in us for everything that we see. It goes on to say this. 
and pride for our achievements and possessions. Because we don't know our worth, we're trying to prove our worth. We try to establish our worth by what we've achieved or what we own, what we possess. It goes on to say this, These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. Get that? Everything that people... So the world stirs cravings in us, but the things are all passing away. It's inevitable. The system destructs on its own. It can't go on for long. But anyone who does the will, uh, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Last year, just one year, one year in our world, $630 billion was spent in advertising. Now, I want you to think about what is advertising. Remember that commandment we read, Exodus 20, 17? Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet your neighbor's uh, ox or you know, his donkey or his manservant or maidservant or anything. Well, the whole foundation of advertising is to get me and you to covet, to desire, to want what I don't have. Okay, contrary to what God says. Now, I know you're saying, but, but Randy, you know, we, we have to have certain products and not all advertising is just arousing cravings in us for things that we don't really need. I understand that. I understand it completely. But what I am saying is that the vast majority of advertising dollars, $630 billion, they are spent to cause you and I and other human beings across the planet for the first time in human history, we can see things all over the world. I can see Every product that the most wealthy people in the world have by just going to my TV or my little phone, whatever it might be. So all of a sudden, these advertisers show us things that exist, show us things that other people have, and what does that do? It stirs cravings in us. We now want something that we did not have that somebody else does have, which really bothers us because, again, we are being taught in society today if I, if I can desire it, or if I do desire it, I should be able to acquire it. If you have it, I should have it. Why should I be deprived? Why should I be cheated? I am entitled to have what I desire. You've got it, so I should have it. So now, man, you've got me hostile. You, you've got me in a very bad frame of mind. And advertising spends $630 billion dollars to arouse cravings in us, to, to literally get us to disobey the 10th command that God gave to human beings. So it's, it's a seductive system, though, because it dangles that in front of us. It says, whatever you desire, man, whatever you desire, you ought to have it. It's yours. You should, you're, you're entitled to whatever you desire. But it's destructive. It's destructive. Listen to what the book of James says. James chapter 1, verse 14. It says, temptation, and the temptation comes this. Once I start desiring something, I now become tempted to acquire it because I'm entitled to it. Temptation, it says, comes from our own desires which entice us or seduce us. It's a seductive system. What, whatever, whatever I desire, I should be able to acquire. They entice us, and then they, they drag us. Notice that. They, they latch on to our affections. Now we've got to have it. We, we, we're thinking of ways to acquire it, and that's where it starts getting dangerous. So let me read it to you a little more fluidly. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. Now I'm coming up with schemes, plots, ideas on how to get what I don't have or what you have maybe, but that I want. I'm coming up with ideas. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And that can be relational death, economic death, emotional death. It can also be physical death. People kill other people to get things they want. This is the world we live in. It's a real truth that we, we have to comprehend. So this, this human entitlement uh, process, it, it creates a cycle. And so I want to break this down for you. I'm calling it the entitlement cycle. And the entitlement cycle goes like this. It starts with convictions. If, if I desire it, I should be able to inquire. I, I should be able to acquire it. In other words, whatever I desire, I'm entitled to it. And if I don't have it, I'm being ripped off. I'm being cheated, deprived, and so now I'm hostile. So the conviction is whatever I desire, I should be able to acquire. That creates expectations. I'm entitled to it if I desire it. 
then that leads to inevitable frustration because I cannot acquire everything that I desire. In fact, no one can. And so this system, it caves in on itself. It creates more and more frustration, more and more hostility. It gets us where we're willing to look at each other in predatory ways and do things that should never be done. It, it creates lawlessness. It creates an injustifies the means kind of a reasoning. In other words, if I'm entitled to it, whatever I have to do to get it is okay. Let me show you the, the conclusion that it comes to. It creates its own very frightening moral code. And we are seeing this spread more and more across our planet today. The moral code goes like this. Whatever gives me what I want, when I want it, that's what's good. How do I determine what's good? Whatever gives me what I want, when I want it, that's good. This is why we see people take bricks and throw them through store windows. And then we see 20, 30, 100 people run in, gather up uh, products that do not belong to them, and they're happy as clams when they, when they can get out the door with these stolen items, things that they desired, therefore they felt entitled to. And it doesn't just happen there. It happens all across many, many other sectors. Whatever people desire, this, this, this lie is pervasive in our society today. Whatever I desire, I ought to be able to acquire it. If someone else has it, I ought to be able to have it too. And if I don't have it, I'm being cheated. Now I'm hostile. Therefore, since it's mine, I'm entitled to it. Whatever I have to do to get it, whatever, it's good because it belongs to me anyway. This, this is a very, very dangerous, dangerous thing. Wars happen because of this. One nation sees that another country has resources that it wants and decides we're entitled to it. And then they do what they have to do to acquire it. Now, we want to contrast that. As important as recognizing the dynamics of human entitlement are, it's really much more important to internalize the dynamics of divine entrustment. God has a whole different way of operating. God, first of all, He entrusts Himself to us. He reveals Himself. He says, this is who I am. This is what my plans and purposes are. I love you. I created you in my image. I created you for myself. I desire to spend all eternity with you. I want so much for you to experience life on the level that I myself do, but I can't do it unless you trust me. If you trust me, I'll teach you to live the way that I live and to love the way that I love, and then you can experience life in all its fullness. So God's system is based on entrustment. He entrusts Himself to us, and then if we choose to trust Him, to trust he, he Himself as He's fully revealed in Christ and become His follower, then He entrusts us with more. He says, okay, now that you're my child, now that you're my servant, now that you're my representative, now that you're my co-worker, I'm going to entrust you with some time on the planet. I'm going to trust you with some talents and abilities and some spiritual gifts. I'm going to trust you with some financial resources. I'm going to trust you with some experiences and opportunities. And you know what I want you to do. You know what my will is. You know what my word says. You know what my work on planet Earth is. It is to bring as many as possible back into a trusting relationship with their Creator so that the eternal destiny that the Creator has always intended for us to experience with Him can be passed on to as many as is possible. So he, he just, he's instructive. He just lays it out for us. He doesn't seduce us. He doesn't trick us. He doesn't try to overwhelm our feelings and get us to desire something, whether it's wise or not. He says, this, this is who I am. This is what I offer. And then he just lays it out with crystal clarity so that, listen carefully now, because I'm going to take you somewhere where you may not like, but it's an important place you need to go. He makes it crystal clear what I can, you can expect from Him in this life. He just is instructive. So we need to internalize the, the dynamics of the divine, intr divine entrustment, and it's instructive. Here's its foundational conviction. When God provides, I will not be deprived. I want to ask you, do you have that conviction in your heart? I trust my God to, to, to provide for me, and when He provides for me, I will never be deprived. Contrast that with the other system, the, the uh, human entitlement system. It's, if I desire it, I should be able to acquire it. Contrast that with divine entrustment. When God provides, 
I will not be deprived. Is that what you believe? Now, before you say yes too quickly, let's read what's involved in that. Listen to this passage of Scripture from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need. Everything we need for what? Where, where is He going? So, His divine power has given us, not some things, everything. Everything we need, but, but need for what? What's going to answer that? Everything we need to experience life, that's everything involved in my whole lifetime, your whole lifetime, any experience I encounter. His divine power has given us everything we need to experience life and to reflect God's true nature. But how? How, is he, how did His divine power provide this? Um, this ability to experience life and reflect God's true nature. Through the knowledge of the One who called us by His own glory and virtue. It's talking about Christ. What is He saying? you got to kind of unpack this one. This one takes some time and some thought. He's saying that look at Christ. He is the standard. He is the revelation. Look at what His life was like. Look how He was sustained. He, he was literally indestructible until His mission was through. He was on the cross and He dismissed His spirit. Uh, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So He was indestructible. He was resourced. He was fully resourced until His mission was up. This is supposed to be instructive to you and I. It's supposed to say, just like the Father provided for Jesus, so I too will be provided for. Whatever I need until my mission is finished, will be provided. That's where we go back to that core conviction when it says, when God provides, I will not be deprived. But we need to look at that a little deeper. What was Jesus' life like? You know, today, occasionally we have some uh, calamitous weather things. Could be a hurricane, could be tornadoes, could be, you know, earthquakes, sometimes war, and suddenly people that have lived in quite good conditions, nice homes, nice circumstances, climate control, electricity, the whole nine years, all of a sudden we are displaced in war zones. This is a horrific thing. People are displaced and they have to live in what we call refugee camps. Power outages for prolonged periods of time can do the same thing. Suddenly, these people that lived quite nicely are living literally hand to mouth day to day. They they're, have supplies trucked in, water trucked in, food trucked in, and they literally live in makeshift shelters or tents with minimum uh, protection from the elements. You know, they, they usually have something to keep them out of the rain or the snow, and they have blankets and so forth to keep them from the cold, but pretty much the refugee camp experience is one that we would consider horrific. I mean, it's like, how bad can it get? To go from living in your nice apartment or house to suddenly living in a refugee camp where food and water are carted into you every day and, and you have minimal shelter, we would say, that's, that's just horrific. There are people that have lived in refugee camps for years now in war zones. But have you ever considered? That was Jesus' life. <laughs> that was Jesus' life. He didn't own a house. He... He had food enough for the day. He had no climate control whatsoever unless he fanned himself on a hot day. I mean, the world that Jesus... And so our expectations when it says that God's going to provide and He's provided everything we need for life and everything we need for, for godliness or, or to reflect God's glory, it's all in Jesus. It's saying that I need to adjust my expectations that Jesus is the standard. Now, now, the New Testament gets even more specific. Listen to this word again from the Apostle Paul that he's sending to Timothy. Timothy was doing some work to correct some things in the church of Ephesus when this was written, 1 Timothy 6. He says to Timothy, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment, notice that word. Godliness with contentment. Godliness is living the way God lives, thinking the way God thinks, doing the things God would do. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take, and we cannot take anything out of the world. Now listen to verse 8, because it, 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 it tells me, what can I expect God to provide for me? What can I trust Him to provide? But if we have food and clothing, and that word clothing there, it could be, it could be translated sheltering, you know, clothing, shelter, whatever. If we have food and clothing, with these we will be and what is the word? Content. 
So God promises this, that as long as we are still in his, on mission for Him in this world, He will provide what we need to sustain our life, to keep us alive. He'll provide us food, and He'll provide us shelter. Now, He doesn't say what kind of shelter. Look at the sheltering and look at the food that Jesus had. It, it was not by any means the standards of today. God has been pleased to lavish upon us extravagant wealth today. So we, we are experiencing life in a way that of the 108 billion people who live, you know, we're the only ones to experience electricity, technology, climate control, uh, you know, airplanes, uh, cars, and all these kinds of things that we take for granted. But that's not what God promises. He says, you and I must learn to be content with food and shelter. And that's for the day. They didn't have refrigerators. They couldn't preserve any food for the most part. So it's instructive. When we internalize dynamics of divine entrustment, we've got to be realistic with our expectations. God is not promising this abundance. We tend to think today that the, the number one assurance that God's favoring us, He's blessing us, He's for us, is we have massive abundance. Everything is just going our way. We have so much, and that's the mark. Would you ever allow the thought that having little to nothing or not having what you consider, what I consider enough, that that could actually be the manifestation of God's favor and blessing? Because I'm going to show you a verse that indicates that is exactly the truth. We, we just need to expand, folks. We need to expand our horizons on the way God is working in this age. Because again, remember what I said, God looks at our time on this earth very different than we do. If we live to be 100 years old, it says, A day with the Lord in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it says, A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. That means that if I live, you live to be 100 years old, in God's timing, the way He looks at our journey on this earth, it's about 2.4 hours. By the way, we sleep one-third of those away. So He sees whatever the conditions we're living in uh, to be very short compared to the eternity that He has awaiting for us, in which the desires of our heart will be fulfilled forever and ever and ever. So it's instructive and it's also constructive, whereas... The human entitlement system, it's seductive and destructive. God's system of divine entrustment, it's instructive and constructive. Listen to this from Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. It's the Apostle Paul. Once again, by the way, he wrote this from prison, and he wasn't so sure whether he was going to be executed or not. He does get, a, get out from this imprisonment. But in Philippians 4, verse 11, he says, he says, I'm not saying this because I need anything. I have learned, notice this, it was a learned experience. It came by going through things. I have learned to be content. There's that word again. No matter what happens to me. Paul says, I've learned to be content no matter what happens to me. Well, what happened to you, Paul? I know what it's like to have what I need. Okay. Have what I need, food and clothing. According to God, that's what we need. I know what it's like to have what I need. I also know what it's like to have more than I need. Um, I, I think I might have misread something here. I, I, I did. Let, let me go back and read verse 12 to you. I know what it's like not. I left a key word out. I know what it's like not to have what I need. Pause for a minute. Do you have some area of your life right now where you feel like I don't have what I need. I, I, I don't, I, my need is not being met in some area of my life. I'm entitled to more than I'm getting. My need in a certain area of my life, it is not being met. Because Paul, the greatest servant that the kingdom of God has probably ever known, he said in verse 12, I know what it's like not to have what I need. I also know what it's like to have more than I need. I have learned the secret, I've been initiated, I've learned the secret of being content no matter what happens. Well, Paul, what, what happens? I am content whether I am well-fed or, what's the word? Hungry. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, we read that verse which said that God will provide you food and clothing and that we should be content with that. And here Paul says he learned to be content when he was hungry. But he never died. He survived. He, he had what he needed to finish his mission. Sometimes he had a full belly. Sometimes, evidently, he had an empty belly for a period of time. He says, I'm content whether I am well-fed 
or hungry, which means the greatest servant of God ever had was at times hungry and admitted earlier he didn't have his needs met. I am content whether I have more than enough or not enough. Paul, wait a minute. You mean sometimes you didn't have enough? You didn't have your needs met? You were hungry? Yes, that's what he's saying. And he's saying that he never doubted God's faithfulness. He said he learned to be content. I can do all things by the power of Christ that he gives me this strength. So here we see it's constructive. God's system, it stretches us. It builds us. It, it builds confidence in God. It, it builds Christ-like character. It positions us to be more effective in communicating and connecting with others to have more compassion and understanding of the human plight. So when I internalize the dynamics of divine entrustment, it creates a cycle as well. And here's the way the entrustment cycle goes. I have convictions. My convictions are when God provides, I will never be deprived. When what He says is enough for me in any given circumstance, He knows what's best. It's enough for me, whether it's plenty like Paul says or whether it's not plenty. So that's my convic conviction and my expectations are simple. God's going to keep me alive and resource me for whatever it is that He wants me to do until my mission is over with. And that brings satisfaction. Contrast that with the entitlement cycle. I have convictions. Whatever I desire, I should be able to acquire. I'm entitled to it, but I can't get it, so I end up frustrated and angry and hostile, and I'm tempted to do bad things to get what I want. The entrustment cycle, I have convictions. Whatever God provides for me, uh, I'm never going to be deprived. He will resource me in the way that He knows is best so that I can fulfill my mission, which is different than your mission, and this brings me satisfaction. Paul said, I learned to be content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether my needs were met or not met. So here we have an illustration that the blessing of God, because there was no one more blessed on the planet than Paul, can exist when a person's circumstances do not look like he has abundance in any way, shape, or form. But God was doing exactly the right thing. Now, I want to close by um, giving you an illustration that I hope will, will shatter this pervasive piece of propaganda that, that we can hardly escape from that tells us around the clock we're entitled. We're entitled to more. We're entitled to everything we desire. We're entitled to newer, nicer, bigger, better forever. I'm going to tell you an old, old story. So I'm asking your, your forgiveness in advance because some of you have heard this. It's an old story, but it's a good story. So... I hope it'll still be meaningful to you. The old story goes like this. There was a king in a certain domain somewhere, and this king became very, very ill. It was an illness that looked like it could be deadly. So his soothsayers and wise men, and they all got around him and his shamans and shamans and, and all these people, and they said, King, we, we've, we've gotten an answer. We've gotten an insight. We know what needs to happen for you to be cured. You must find the shirt of a contented man and you must wear the shirt of this contented man for one day and one night. Do not take it off. Wear it, and you will be cured of your illness. So the king says, all right, let there be a search. And so he sends out massive amounts of his, his soldiers to search all through his kingdom. And weeks go by, and weeks turn into months, and months, and months go by, and they cannot find a contented man. The king starts to really lose hope. He's getting sicker and sicker. He, he's on the edge of death. And then one day, one of his men, one of his soldiers comes in and says, King, King, we have found a contented man. But the king looks at the soldier's face and he says, This is good news. This is wonderful. Why is your face looking so sad? And the king says, This is cause for celebration. Go quickly. Go back. And get the shirt from the man. I need his shirt so that I can wear it one day and one night and, and be rid of this troublesome condition that I'm in. So let us celebrate. Go quickly. Go quickly. And the soldier says, Sire, that's the problem. The contented man that I found, he did not own even one shirt. Now the point is clear that if we feel like we're entitled, we're never going to be satisfied and we're going to be angry and hostile. And it's probably going to lead us to do some angry, hostile things. But if we trust God and we trust what He provides to be enough, we can learn to be content in any and every situation. So let's ask a couple questions. Number one, this is a tough one. 
How much has this notion that we are entitled snuck its way into my mind or your mind, your psyche, my psyche, so that we now in various areas of our life are also feeling the, that we are entitled? Remember, God said in the same book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 19, the Apostle Paul says, My God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And yet Paul had just said eight verses earlier that sometimes he didn't have his needs met and sometimes he was hungry. So God sees our needs being whatever it takes to keep us alive until our mission is finished. It doesn't mean that we're going to have an abundance. So you and I must, must search our souls with God's help and say, how much have I, I allowed this entitlement attitude sneak into my own mind? And by God's grace, we, we need to start rooting it out. The second question is this one. I, I, I urge you to use this one phrase that I had down here as a diagnostic to, to give you some clarity, some objectivity about where you stand with this idea of contentedness and divine entrustment. And the statement is this, whatever deepens my trust in God, builds Christ-like character, and better positions me to reach others is good. Remember, the other um, cycle had, a, had a, a moral code, whatever gives me what I want when I want it, that's what's good. But God's entrustment cycle, the code is whatever deepens my trust in God. So whatever the circumstance, whatever it is that causes my trust in God to go deeper, that's good. Whatever causes the cultivation, the growth of Christ-like character, whether it's a hard circumstance or an easy one, that's good. Whatever better positions me to reach others, whether it's a hard circumstance or an enjoyable one, that is also good. It's a totally different code, and that code brings contentment, brings satisfaction. It brings peace, which passes all understanding, and it will sustain us. It will lead us forward into victory over whatever we may face in these perilous times until Christ our King returns and then gives us forever the bounties, the bounties of our heart's desire. Look, folks, even if we had everything our heart's desire in this world, it's too small because God has something bigger and better, and it's going to last forever. Your best days, my best days as a Christ follower, they have not started. They don't start until Jesus returns and we receive our new resurrection, immortal bodies. Then your best days start, and they last forever. Let's pray. Father, we, we see this sweeping our planet, this sense that uh, people are entitled to whatever they desire, and we see the anger that it creates when they feel that they cannot acquire what they desire. May you give we, your people, the followers of yourself as you've revealed yourself in Jesus, may you give us discernment to, to root this out of our own souls, and may you give us uh, a set of realistic expectations that we can, like Paul, learn to be content in any and every situation when our needs are not being met as well as when our needs are being met, when we are hungry as well as when we are well fed, when we have all that we need and in, in an abundance as when we don't have what we need. May your Spirit work this in us as only your Spirit can. I ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.